really going to love these guests. Uh, uh, please join me in welcoming two of the gentlemen, both in front of and behind the camera, who brought this movie to life. Uh, first, the brilliant filmmaker, who is, of course, a three-time Academy Award winner. His previous films include 21 Grams and Birdman. And for his work on The Revenant, he has already won the Golden Globe Award for Best Director and been nominated for a DGA Award and an Academy Award for Best Director. Please welcome Alejandro D. and <laughs> someone who has played everything from the world's youngest con artist to Howard Hughes. Still, I doubt even his biggest fans were prepared for his stunning, revelatory work in The Revenant. Please welcome Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Mine was a Matchbox Cars uh, commercial. Well, that's not technically true. I did an episode of Romper Room, which was a television show when I was four or five, and they kicked me off because I ran up to the camera and was shaking it to look at me. And uh, then they kicked me off the show. But my first professional paid job in the industry was a Matchbox uh, Toys uh, commercial, and I played a gangster, a young gangster with sunglasses, and I flipped the matchbox thing over and said, Do you want to play? And then I played. <laughs> and for you? Um, the very, very early one is, uh, is, 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 is embarrassing, but it's, um, I received a little payment. It was the first professional payment. Uh, I, there was a friend that I was just always making kind of playing with words and putting nicknames to friends and things like that. And he said, you know, my father has a, how do you say that, like when they fix cars, you know, like yeah. mechanic, mechanic thing. And, uh, and, and it was called, they, 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 the, the second name was Romita, not they, the second name of the family was Romita mechanic. Kind of, uh, said, you know, you're very great. What do you think we can do in a radio? Like, we need a radio spot. They were paying a radio spot in this little, tiny little, little station. And, uh, and I came with the idea that they loved, and it was it was <laughs> super stupid. It was rom 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 romina. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's great! And they loved the stupid thing, so it was like rom 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 romina, and I got paid, and that was it. <laughs> Radio commercial. <laughs> Uh, so, speaking about The Revenant, I know this is based on Michael Punk's uh, 2002 novel of the same name, and I think it's something that both of you have been interested in for a while, if that's true. It was years ago that the project first came to you? Uh, well, in my case, um, basically I read a, a first draft uh, written by Michael Smith uh, like six years ago, and, um, and it was loosely based already in the Michael Punk uh, novel. Basically, it just had kind of the, the title and the the, the bear attack and the, the, the basic story of the abandon and the survival skills. Uh, and then obviously I, I, I jumped in, I, I really was uh, very attracted by the, the possibilities that it offered. So then I started rewriting the script for a couple of, of maybe eight months, something like that. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, I think I got, I, I, in that moment I, with Leo and I got together, we started working as the possibility to work together and it was moving on. I started doing some scouting locations in that time, but then the project of Wolf of uh, Wall Street come in with Leo. He was developing this for a long time. So it, uh, the schedule didn't work. Uh, we put it on 
on hold and then uh, uh, you know a couple of years pass I did Birdman he did that little film and then when I was mixing Birdman it reborn again and I keep rewriting this working with Mark and then it came now what, what it is so that, that was basically but I think Leo maybe I think you you, you, you read some uh, early, even earlier draft of this one right that's how you understand oh even before Alejandro was attached yeah yeah I think that this screenplay had basically been floating around the industry for a while but it was logistically so difficult to pull off that uh, man I think you know many filmmakers shied away from it but Alejandro really had uh, he, was, he was very invested in this script very early on and there was really just something about this screenplay the immersion into the natural world being you know having this be such a you know a, a difficult film was something that I think he looked at as an immense challenge but he wanted to create neorealism I think he wanted to do a docudrama he wanted to go on a massive voyage altogether wow. <laughs> and um, and, I, and I say that I keep saying this but it was I think he, it was even hard for him to articulate why he wanted to do this so much, but it was like something was calling for him. And so it was really just being able to work with him and go on this, this journey that made me incredibly excited about the prospect of doing this movie because I knew it would be a very unique experience and it certainly was. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're reading that script, I mean, it's one thing to read a script and be like, oh, okay, he's attacked by a bear, he falls off a cliff. Did you have, <laughs> that's, that's the IMDb summary of the movie, sorry. <laughs> but did you really have any idea of what you were signing up for? Were there, were there times on set where you sort of said, oh, wow, this is, this is so much more than I expected? <sighs> oh, for sure, for sure. Um, <laughs> I knew, no, I've, I've been a part of films that were difficult to pull off, and, uh, you know, Titanic being one of them, I mean, the film went on, it was, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars over budget, and went on for <laughs> what a good additional seven months. When you bite off something like this, you, you expect that, it comes with the territory. And I knew that, I, I when you work with a director as well, you want to work with a director that is in, incredibly vigilant about their vision. And that means, and Alejandro is a perfectionist. He really is. And I wouldn't want to work with somebody on a film like this that didn't have that attitude, that was flippant about something that was already so incredibly difficult to pull off from the onset. So I knew there, there, I knew there had to be some sort of buffer of time and budget that would, would, would expand this process and make it even more difficult. I think what we never could have determined was a how hard it was to shoot in these conditions with these incredibly cold temperatures and very distant locations that were very hard to get to. But the weather was fluctuated so much that you know we'd have landscapes that were completely frozen one day and come back the next day, and we'd have to shut down for weeks at a time because there would be absolutely no snow, or we'd come in into an environment where it was 40 below zero and cameras wouldn't even operate it was so cold outside so we could have never determined how you know powerful nature really was as far as its uh, complication in, in making this movie and and in making it so visceral and immediate you made a lot of choices you shot chronologically um, you shot only in natural light um, again was did it were there ever moments where you said you know maybe maybe I could have built a sound stage <laughs> sometimes I regret not to have done it <laughs> no I, I, I have to say that uh, the film uh, the way it exists uh, uh, it's because obviously we made uh, uncomfortable decisions but uh, but but uh, in a way I think that's our job and that's our, our duty you know I think that uh, um, many decisions sometimes today are taken in the comfort comfortable zone, but obviously the results can can be sometimes can work for certain material. This material and this story requires this. So I mean, I think it could have been impossible to recreate this in a green screen set or with plates and things like that. I think it could have been, you know, not this film at at at, at least, you know. And uh, even when the, the decisions that were made and I made logistically and in terms aesthetically. 
and uh, and how the film should be perceived were based not in uh, madness or irresponsibility. I think they were based on a very logic uh, thing that when you go deep and observe how a film is uh, prepared and the logistics be behind a film like this that has more than 100 uh, locations, sometimes 60, 100 miles away from each other, and it's a road movie, and every mm. location has to serve narratively something and obey with the seasons and be prepared. Some, some of these locations were prepared in summer to be ready on December to mm. prepare for the horses, for the action, for the trucks, for that. So we prepare in advance, mm -hmm. moving ahead. All what it requires is and because the time of the day, so we have a daylight that uh, three o'clock in winter is dark. You know, three o'clock is dark, absolutely. And when you are shooting under the trees, you have less light even. So the window of light was so little that actually we had to shoot just one, two hours because by the time that we traveled, we were ready to make up and all the actors were ready. It, it was such a small amount of time that we had to shoot it basically with natural light. There was no even, it will be a crazy to shoot it with artificial light because even where you put the generator, the cables, where you hide it in these 360 degrees, <laughs> why to light something so beautiful as the light that we have there? Because I mean, there was so many things that seems crazy for producers, but then when I explained them, I said, yes, it's true, there was no other way to do it. And the chronological order to, in a way, there was no other way to, it always, all my films I shoot it that way, but, but this one, there was two reasons. One, logistically, the, the, the film and, and the character is moving through the seasons. So I couldn't shoot the ending of the film when there was no snow or, or you know, or vice versa. So I had to obey that. And the other reason is that I like, as a director, to give me and to give the actors the opportunity and the story itself to sometimes <clears throat> You, you can domain your work, you can be God of your work, sometimes you can become the creature of it, and you have to hear, and the things start changing, and, and a film like this that we shot for nine months, yeah. as a person you change in nine months, and being impacted by that weather and alone by your house, I think there's a lot of things that the work that we are doing every day, what Leo was bringing in the action, what he was adding, there was things that were not in the script, or the things that I dream at night, or suddenly I put together two things and I said, you know, I think this will be missing here, or things you discover seven months later. And I think Liu is knowing his character, where he's going, me and Chivo is knowing another thing. So we all grow, and then you let things come in, and because it's chronological, you grow with it, and then the film ends up in a different way, and that's a great opportunity to let the animal to reveal itself in a different way. Have you ever shot a film in chronological order before, and did you find that it helped? It does help a lot. I, I, I've attempted to in the past, but <laughs> I think so many, so much of the time, you know, there's so many different uh, logistical problems with locations that, and 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 making a movie that it doesn't end up being that way. This was the closest. I mean, we we couldn't do it precisely that way, but this was the closest we ever did, as far as chronological order is uh, is concerned. But yeah, I, as far as what Alejandro was saying, I completely agree with it. I I think that we didn't know what this. Who this character was, I think we didn't understand, you know, um, by the propens by by the fact sheer fact that this entire film was moved by the action and the sheer force of Hugh Glass moving forward constantly. We had to find, I think, the poetry and and what this movie was about by actually immersing ourselves in this environment and step by step going through this man's journey and. S seeing what we found along the way. This movie had to be done in this way. It could not never have been pre-planned in a, in, in a studio. So many of the shots, of course, were incredibly complex. I think Alejandro he's, he's, had been thinking about them for years in advance, but it, as far as the narrative and who Hugh Glass was and what uh, the movie was ultimately about, it had to be done in this manner. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been uh, you know, the story that it was. And, the reasoning behind making this entire movie uh, wouldn't have had the same purpose. And to that end, I mean, did it, it change your take on the character? Did you end up somewhere where you didn't expect? For, for, I believe I heard the ending even changed because while you were making the movie, uh, and uh, he knows how I feel about the ending, I think the last shot is a master class in acting. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, it's just sublime. Um, and I was surprised to hear that wasn't planned from the beginning. 
No, what I was saying yesterday is that basically the ending was, you know, there was a couple of choices and then is one of the advantages that when you have the time and then <laughs> we have to wrap in, 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 in Calgary so then we have three months to be, you know, looking around the world to see where is the snow. So many <laughs> ideas came as I was editing the film. But then, you know, there was this idea of, you know, of looking to camera that I, that I, that I think it, that, came from some place and it's not a rational thing and, uh, and uh, which I think is a very risky one and Neo immediately responded to it and uh, again this has come from suddenly both were completely in sync and in connection with something that it cannot be articulate or there's no reason or there is no like yes because this means this or that it's <laughs> suddenly you find that that touch is, is what it, it was it and let me tell you I think it's one of the most difficult things because it can break the whole thing of the film. I mean, it's a very risky movement, and I agree with you. I think th this ending just exists. It's possible, and the only reason it's there is because it sounds and it can be easy, but I think to have the camera, the end of the film, carrying the film during two hours and a half, and have the camera five inches, uh, and uh, and sustain to cross and break the wall and sustain that every micro element that Leo is doing there is absolutely uh, true and honest and, and real and, and powerful that I think without the performance that level this could have been absolutely a mistake but I think he just sustained it that bad that it was a, a notion, an intellectual idea that when it's executed the way Leo did it, it worked and it's absolutely revelatory in another thing, at least for me too, it worked in a way that, that I never even expected as an idea. The way it ex it's, it's about the execution, you know, because it's not the first time that some director has that idea at all. But the execution is where really I think then the film sustain or elevate the film in another level that it's, it's, a mystery, it's a mystery, maybe you can like it or not, but definitely for me, uh, work. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I do want to bring up, because much has been made of the physicality of your performance, and rightfully so, um, it is beautiful and brutal, uh, but there is so much going on on your face, in your eyes, when you cannot speak for, I think it's something like 40 pages or something, there's no dialogue. Um, when you're looking at a script and you realize you're gonna have to communicate, you're gonna have to act without speaking a word of dialogue for something like 40 pages, is that terrifying or thrilling or both? I, I, it, was ex it was exciting, to be honest. I think that I've been so used to playing characters who are so incredibly articulate and everything that they say has to push the plot along. So you're, you know, films like Wolf of Wall Street or The Aviator where, you know, the psychosis of the character really drives the story. So you have to be the catalyst of the entire narrative. <clears throat> to do a film where, uh, you know, m most of my acting relationship was with Chivo, our cinematographer, was incredibly unique and one something that I really wanted to try I've, I've been a great fan of silent uh, film actors and watching performances like that that I don't know it, it internalizes things in a way that is that is much different and I've never done anything like that and this was this was uh, it was it was something that I I you know obviously I, I think I do the about the same amount of research for every movie and then you pre-plan everything that you possibly can and understand about the time period, who this person is, but when we actually got there and, <clears throat> you know, my encouragement to Alejandro was always, let's strip away as much as he possibly can. I want this guy, whenever he speaks, he's gotta have, you know, purpose and meaning. I want it to be like haiku. I don't want him to open his mouth unless he has really something to say. And we did that and, and then all of a sudden, you know, it, it becomes this this entirely different process where you really just, it's a very, it becomes very instinctive. You know, you're not, everything that you planned beforehand just kind of washes away. And it was just about the internal drive of this man pushing forward every single day. And it kind of doesn't become acting, it just becomes like being, you know? And that's what I think a lot of the actors felt in this movie. 
because he created this environment for us that was so tangible and real and visceral. I mean, we were really doing this shit, so it's like, <laughs> it's, you know, at some point it just becomes, it doesn't become um, so cerebral. It becomes just uh, like a instinct to move, push on. Yeah, my favorite story from the set, I may have told you this, is Mark Smith, the co-writer, told me he was there the day you jumped into the river and you came out and your lips were literally blue. That is not special effects. And he said, it was the first time in my life I didn't want to be Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I know people probably ask how you got him to do all these things, but from what I understand, you even more like, try, I don't want to say tried to hold him back, but for example, um, everyone knows you ate raw bison liver. Um, you were hesitant about that, weren't you? You didn't want him to get sick. Well, I, I think he was hungry that day, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> he got some uh, bison uh, liver taco, and I said, okay, go for it. <laughs> Bring some tortillas. <laughs> and, uh, no, I think, uh, you know, we have two choices, but Leo was hesitant about that. He was right. I think the, the artificial one was not as good, you know, as uh -huh. looking. You know, uh, the taste is, was not so juicy. And, uh, and, uh, and I said, like, I'll try. I said, are you sure? I said, yes, I, let's, let's do it. And uh, so it was there available, and Leo went for it. And uh, it was amazing, because uh, obviously his reaction is in camera, because it was a great reason that things happen like that, because obviously his throat is absolutely, as a character, is absolutely his burn still is the first solid thing that he's eating. So there's kind of a contrary reaction to it. And then all his eyes were but watery because he was so. Uh, so that that thing, in a way, it make absolutely. Again, is is when things are true, you can. It, there's no better than that. You know what I mean? But I think he was he was for it, and I think in every moment, the physicality that he demands in Leo, it, uh, you know, he went for it, and we, we, we don't talk about. I never force him, just yeah. gone one, two times. <laughs> <laughs> Only two times. So that's well, I, I have to ask because I will never get the opportunity again. What does bison liver taste like? Uh, <laughs> uh, really gross. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's kind of got this membrane, this mm. balloon membrane. And then you bite into it, and it's kind of like, I don't want to say this, but it's like a giant hot zit bursting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I do want to take a couple questions from the audience. Just raise your hand. Let's start back there on the aisle. How and where did you cast the Native American actors? Oh, casting the Native American actors. Great question. Yeah, great question. Uh, basically, you know, it was a long and, uh, you know, all over the United States and Canada because. Uh, you know, for me, it was very important to get it right. Uh, sometimes, uh, some films always portray, uh, you know, Native Americans. Uh, I don't know. Normally, they are very uh, incredibly uh, the feet, like the bodies are really like uh, bodybuilders, yeah. and it's like a contemporary body, and there's something about modeling kind of thing. And uh, and you know, you, I, we, we, I saw so many beautiful kind of lithography and paintings and photographs. Uh, of Native Americans and the real features and the dignity of them and the, the, the depth in his eyes and things that I was really trying to, to get real, real people that really connect with something special. And uh, so, uh, you know, it was hard because most sometimes I cast so many people and, and the ones that were some, sometimes trained, they were kind of pre, pre, pre prejudiced in his own. I kind of said some biases that sometimes because what they have been asked for them, they suddenly repeat themselves or they put these kind of faces. So I don't know, there was some things that were not right in people that sometimes has had some other experience and I, was, I wanted to get out of that, to get some people that really feel real. So uh, the way I decide for unexpected choices like uh, Forrest Goodluck, for example, obviously is a kid that uh, has never done a film before, but he has an incredible face, incredible eyes, and obviously uh, uh, we work with him, I work with him for months, you know what I mean? To get him there emotionally, to understand. He's a filmmaker, he's a very young guy, very mature, 
uh, uh, and he's from New Mexico. And then, um, uh, for example, Arthur Red Cloud, which is uh, the, the guy in the Buffalo scene, the guy who healed Hugh Glass and the, the guy who traveled with him and his hand, he's uh, um, uh, a driver. Uh, he basically is a truck driver that worked in Texas, uh, in Dallas, I think, uh, getting oil uh, around Texas. So it's a very uh, you know, it's a truck driver that has never seen a camera before, but when he arrived and he talked to me, the way he, he was connected with the spirit of his people, his mm. tradition, the vibe in, the, in the, the, the casting, everything was right. And, and he was super, he was more, you know, chubby. And, uh, he's, he, so he started doing exercise for three months with dieties, just because I didn't want him to be lean or like that. But I didn't want, because in that time, the Native Americans were not uh, overweight because they were always very fit because they just eat like protein. So it has to be real. So he suffered a lot doing that for two months. <laughs> and he did his best to get it right. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and another, uh, another guy, uh, uh, Howard, in basically the, he, he, he's a guy from Canada that has been doing just social work for so many years, uh, uh, taking care of kids in the drugs and the alcohol. Uh, uh, L Dog, the character of uh, L Dog, uh, doing Howard is called, uh, and he's almost like a saint. Honestly, he has devoted 30 years to help alcoholics and drug addicts in the streets, and he has this very beautiful face. He has done some films, few of them. It's a lot of stunt, stunt. A, a lot of his, and it's stunt. So when I see, saw his face and he's a stunt in some film, I said, wow. But again, uh, they, they, they were from Canada, from United States. But the fact that they were not very uh, trained, I think that they connected in a very spiritual way. And you know, we try hard, all of us in the, in the crew, that, and this, from the story, you know, the, the, what makes this country so wonderful is that uh, the fabric, the social fabric of this country since the beginning is built on a polychromatic uh, social, you know, the diversity of, of mixed races and blood, you know, from all around the world. In my country, we are mixed races, but it's basically Spanish and indigenous people. Here, there's people from all around the world. But I think the Native Americans has to be represented as they should, I have to say. And, and, and properly, in a way, with the same complexity as human beings, uh, not as saints, not as demons, but just complex people. And, you know, so we try uh, all the, always to really represent them, and we always consult them, and we have uh, people around us to guide us to, to not to not take, uh, I would say, misinterpreted by creative licenses, things that can be insulting. So in a way, they really participate creatively too with us to represent them and, and that with, dignity, with dignity and that. And it was an absolute pleasure to, to, to work with these communities. And most of the film was shot in, 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 in native lands that they were always blessed us. And, uh, so anyway, the relation with the, with the native communities and the cast was, uh, Sorry to be so long, but it, it was it's very exciting to work with those guys. Um, and, and I have to ask, because I know everybody wants to know, possibly your most important scene partner, um, the bear attack scene, is, uh, I, I mean, there aren't enough adjectives in the world to describe this. Uh, have, is, is, that, is it more difficult for you to do, like, a big dramatic monologue, to perform without speaking, or to have to act opposite you know, an attack scene, something like that, that you that is solely you in many ways. I, I re generally hate stunts, to be honest, because I'm very afraid of hurting other people or getting hurt myself. So it's always a certain amount of anxiety before a sequence like that. But you know, what was so incredibly helpful, and what I really learned a lot from making this movie was the importance of rehearsal. I mean, there, I, I can't stress it enough. I mean, I, I know that there's so much put on spontaneity and performances, but really, honestly, to have done this bear sequence, or even the opening sequence, where Alejandro, I think, cinematically set the bar so high, where he was doing things cinematically that I didn't even understand as an actor, but we rehearsed for two, three weeks, if not a month, just for that opening sequence where, you know, he and Chivo 
uh, on a cerebral level get you into the mindset of each one of the fundamental characters of, of the movie through this long winding, you know, sort of snake that's weaving its way into very intimate moments with characters and then panning off to very David Lean-esque, beautiful, wide cinemascope <laughs> moments and seamlessly doing this, this shot that uh, just kind of took my breath away and I didn't really understand what he was doing. I mean, it, it's almost like, you know, it really is uh, like some cinematic creature that's possessing the mind of each one of these characters. And then we went on to this bear sequence which was rehearsed at, at great length and um, Alejandro doesn't, and, and respectfully so, doesn't want us to, doesn't want me to speak too much about how that was done because uh, I think that, you know, it was uh, a lot of things that he put a lot of thought into as a, as a filmmaker and, and, I, and I respect that. But every tool I think that was, that he could have possibly used in modern day cinema he used to, to create what I feel is one of the most groundbreaking scenes in, in cinema history. I really, it's, um, so, so much of it. To me, I always talk about how, you know, why certain films or sequences are good, and it's tension, you know? If you can create tension in whatever genre you're creating throughout for the main characters, and if you're on the edge of your seat, you've created, you know, not necessarily a great film, but certainly an engaging film. And that sequence, because of those silent moments, you don't know what the bear is gonna do next, this primal, relationship where you're just the anticipation of really feeling like you're watching man versus beast in that sequence is unlike anything that I've ever seen that and that comes from him watching a hundred different bears attacks in real life and it comes from him you know dirtying up the fur of that bear thinking about you know the relationship between a mother and her cubs everyone's trying to survive the bear is a symbol of that too it's a creature trying to survive like we all all the main characters are so much thought was you know people all often ask you know why is why are these filmmakers so great what do they do what, you know, what do they do different than what i do they put a lot of goddamn thought into this <laughs> they think about it you know they think about it for months if not years in advance and they do their research and that 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 stuff, that shit doesn't happen by accident. This man has been thinking about this for years. Literally years, so that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Did you. I know you've watched like 100 hours of bear attacks on YouTube. I can't even imagine what that does to someone's mind. Did you watch any of those attacks as well? No, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> What he has to suffer, I think I have to say what is impressive too, there's no stunts, like, like all what you see is Leo there being, 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 being physically, uh, you know, dragged by it. And, uh, and, uh, and I have to say, it, it, it's funny because uh, it was, as Leo says, was planet, took like two days to shoot in a beautiful forest in British Columbia. Um, but yes, uh, a, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of things went in, but it was, it was, it was fun to do it in some way. Uh, let's take one more question right down here. from the bear fight to the Tom Hardy fight. Um, I think at that moment, the emotions that we're going through are much as let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> no, we literally, <laughs> I mean, that was after, God, eight, nine months in Canada, and then we had a week and a half in, um, in the southern tip of, we had to fly uh, without getting into my whole climate change spiel, which you don't want me to get into. Maybe some of you do, but you don't, I don't know. But, you know, we very briefly experienced more erratic weather than we could have ever imagined. 2015 was the hottest year in recorded history. December was the hottest December ever recorded. We're experiencing it, so anyway, we had to find snow in the southern tip of Argentina to complete that sequence. And, you know, uh, basically we had, again, he had set the bar so high with the bear attack 
that Tom and I needed to go at it in a way that was um, respectful and honoring the visceral, violent exchange of the bear sequence between man, man versus man. Because literally, we, 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 we saw the film up until a certain point, and then the entire ending, we were left sitting and lingering, what, what the hell are we gonna do for the ending? And it just gave us even more determined, I think it was a real benefit that we actually needed to shut down filming at one point before we completed the movie, because we had months, what, six months to sit there and think about, and we were so exhausted and drained at the end of this movie that to have done what we did for, I think, what the audience is waiting for, which is, oh my God, finally these two characters are gonna meet up Better be something incredible. <laughs> had we not recharged our battery batteries and had we not had enough time to stop and rehearse for a week and Tom and I really go at it, um, uh, it wouldn't have been what it was. And I think that, you know, what was interesting for us was, you know, Tom and I, once we get going, we, we just kind of go for it. And it wasn't, it wasn't really working until we really just slowed everything down. And when we slowed everything down, it became a really choreographed, almost dance, like we made it a slow tango, you really got the emotions of that fight sequence. Uh, because I think so many things uh, cinematically go by and whiz by so quickly, you don't get the effect of it, but we made dramatic points with each of it. And um, Alejandro, I'll let you speak about it as well. <laughs> well I think it's that. I, I, I have learned that, you know, like violent scenes, uh, uh, or like these kind of physical scenes like this, or uh, that, that happens in real time as this is shot, is because it's with one take, and, uh, or making love scenes, sex scenes, has to be absolutely, to look wild and to look like crazy and that they are happening, they have to be, to be absolutely choreographed, you know? And it's absolutely uncomfortable, as you can imagine, <laughs> especially the second one, to choreograph a sex scene. But to, to make it look real and powerful and crazy, it has to be perfectly choreographed. So, the battle scene was absolutely like that. It was a ballet, and I think uh, uh, Leo and Tom, at least you know, the, in, in Ushuaia, that is the town, you know, we, we said the choreographer. There's a choreographer that is uh, Doc Coleman, which is great, by the way, because normally one of the dangers of these things, the, the risk that we all try to avoid, uh, and I think in that sense too, Doc do the choreography, but then once. Leon and Tom start, obviously they were getting their own kind of things and they add much more to that, to more realism. One of the dangers is that it looks like a cowboy film, you know what I mean? That those, those kind of punches that look fake or that is too much, how much is too much, how little is too little, all that was discovered through uh, long sessions of rehearsals until they nail it and then obviously to make it real without hurting each other, which that's another component that can be very, you know, you know tricky. <laughs> um, but anyway, it, it was a completely a ballet pre pre designed and then executed in, in perfection. And just to add to that, you know, I've always been a fan of Stanley Kubrick films, and you know, Stanley Kubrick is notorious for doing. You know, I've spoken to actors who said that who said they literally walked in a door and took a left, and I, they said they did 120 takes of that. I said, are you serious? You did 120 takes of walking in and taking a left? I said, yeah, pretty much, and that was what every day was like. And I was, was I, I've always thought about that. You know, I've done films that uh, have a limited amount of rehearsal, but the way this was, uh, this whole film was structured was such a learning curve for me as an actor too because every day was a massive rehearsal. All day long we rehearsed and we had an hour and a half of panic to get everything <laughs> in the natural light but all we did was rehearse all day long and it, and, it, and it was fascinating because I think you know I've always also been a fan of Stanley Kubrick's performances because there's something about the characters where they're just kind of exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> have been stripped of all the artifice <laughs> and all the things they thought the scene was about. Like Nicholson <laughs> saying, 
hair of the dog, Lloyd. You know, it's like, you can tell he's done that so many times. <laughs> you just feel connected. But this was kind of our own version of that in a way. We didn't get to do 100 takes because if we had done that, I think we would have a revolution on our crew. <laughs> all been scout but we got to rehearse like that and it was kind of amazing because you settle in to what you're doing all the actors felt that it was a weird tough transition because we always you know we burst a couple times and then bam we shoot but I think certainly for me I'm not speaking for everyone but once you get into that groove it's like oh I know everything's gonna work this has all been thought about now I get to focus on me being truthful. And that was what was awesome about this experience, one of the things. So I just have to ask, once you finally did finish shooting, what were you more excited to do, go somewhere warm or shave the beard? <laughs> yeah, both. both. <laughs> the, beard, the beard I was glad to get rid of. That was, that was with me for a year and a half. Oh my God. And it needs to be maintained like a partner and you get to condition it and clean it. And... <laughs> well, again, I want to congratulate you guys on the most brutal and beautiful movie of the year. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.